So this is uh, the syllabus, so we are now in lecture 6 and I entitled this lecture uh, Neighborhood Rocky Planets so we have three through of the exploration of the solar system right so let's go back to the rocky planets so first of all let's start with the solar system so well there are things that you're probably very familiar with uh, this is earth over there we discuss about it uh, extensively and this is the sun so first of all in that picture also the distances are not up to scale the size, relative size, are more or less real so you see the size of Earth compared to the size of the Sun it's pretty tiny so our solar system is composed of eight planets um, actually on this one, because it's old, old figure, I should update that it's old figure, so you have Pluto there but Pluto in 2006 has been kicked out from the rank of planets it's not considered as a planet anymore we'll come back uh, in a couple of weeks on that it's now considered as a dwarf planet so we have nine, uh, eight planets on our solar system Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune and they are classified in two categories the telluric or rocky planets which are Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars and the giant or gaseous planets which are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune and they really are very different so I will focus this week on the telluric planets and next week I'll come back on the giant planets and uh, we'll compare them and uh, try to explain why they are so different and then uh, the last uh, the last week of the, of, of the last lecture of the solar system will focus on all the other stuff that are in that solar system actually here it looks pretty clean but there are many many asteroids we mentioned uh, meteorites that are crossing the path of earth a couple of weeks ago and there are many other bodies actually orbiting around the sun in the solar system including those uh, infamous uh, dwarf planets and uh, as part of this last lecture of the, on the solar system I also tried to describe some scenario of how this solar system was formed but so this week we're focusing on the terrestrial planets so here this is just a table summarizing the char different characteristics of those planets so Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars and here I'm putting some uh, other bodies, moons so uh, one, is, uh, one characteristic of those uh, uh, terrestrial planets is that they have very few moons actually only Earth and Mars have moons we discussed the, our moon last week I mentioned last week it's a very peculiar moon actually it's pretty weird so we have to come for a very uh, dedicated scenario to explain the formation of our moon but Deimos and Phobos are very tiny moons on our orbiting mass first of all the distances so this is uh, an astronomical unit as defined as the distance, mean distance between Earth and the Sun so uh, Earth is 1 AU Mercury is 0.4, Venus 0.7, and Mars 1.5. And these are the distances of the Moon from the orbiting planets. So you know that our Moon is around 384,000 kilometers away from us. And you, as you can see, that Deimos and Phobos are far closer to Mars. Orbital periods, that means the time it takes for uh, the planet to orbit the Sun. And uh, the further you are, the longer it takes. This is uh, something we'll discuss a bit more in details when we talk about uh, Kepler laws. Hopefully, we'll have time today. Uh, you know, the orbital period in days of the Earth is 365 days. Rotation period on its um, axis. So you see, Earth is more or less one day. So we discussed about that extensively. Mars orbit on its axis is almost at the same spin as Earth. But you see that Venus is a very slow rotation and I, I notice a little R here that means retrograde that while all the planets like Mercury, Earth and Mars are orbiting in one direction Venus for whatever reason is orbiting the other way around and very slowly and Mercury is spinning on its axis in, 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 in uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, turning on its axis very slowly as well 59 days radius uh, Venus and Mars, uh, Venus and Earth are more or less the same size 
while Mercury and Mars are far bigger. Mars is uh, half of the size of Earth. And in terms of mass, well, once again, Venus and Earth are very similar, but uh, Mars and Mercury are far, are far lighter. Actually, as you can see, the mean density, when you do the ratio between the mass and the volume, and you see that Mercury and Venus on Earth are more or less the same density, that's around five times the density of water, while Mars is slightly lighter, slightly less dense. And once again, the mean density of the Moon is closer to the mean density of Mars, and Deimos are very light. Okay, so we'll try to, we have to explain, when we want to explain the formation of a solar system, we have to explain all those similarities and differences. And finally, it's the gravity. So if we come with me to the museum, they have a, an, an apertures for that. Uh, surface gravity is very different from one planet to another. So if you want to weigh less, you don't have to follow a Weight Watcher program. You just can go to Mars, and then you will far, be far lighter. And you know that on the moon, because you saw the movies, or you may have read Tintin on the moon, which is a nice cartoon from uh, Belgium. And on the moon, you weigh 10% or more or less of your weight on Earth, so you can make massive jumps. So let's have a closer look on those uh, four planets. So these are uh, real pictures taken by probes of the four, uh, four different planets. This is Mercury, this is Venus, this is Earth, and this is Mars. More or less, I've taken, uh, the scale is more or less uh, respected here. So Venus and Earth are very uh, similar in size, while Mercury and, and Mars are smaller. They are mostly composed of rock, also some of them have atmosphere, we know that for Earth. Venus has an atmosphere, Mars has a very, 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 very thin atmosphere, Mercury has no atmosphere at all. But, uh, however, even for Earth, the atmosphere composes a very, very tiny fraction on the, on the planet. What we'll see next week when we'll discuss about uh, ga gas giant planet, gaseous giant planets, the atmosphere is composing a large fraction of the mass at least a larger fraction of the mass. And they all are in the inner part of the solar system. By that I mean if you just look at the, uh, the orbits of the different planets around the Sun, so this is the Sun, in red here we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Here we have what we call the Kuiper Belt, we come back on this, and Pluto is within the Kuiper Belt. Right, so if you zoom in within the orbit of Jupiter, then you have a massive asteroid belt here, and within it, you have the orbit of the four uh, telluric planets, from Mars to Mercury. So they are very close to our Sun, actually. So as we have discussed two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, because last week was a break, three weeks ago, the um, uh, it's possible to describe the geology, how the uh, structure of Earth is made inside the Earth by uh, using seismic waves mainly. So of course it's more difficult to do that on other planets, especially when they don't have, especially when they don't really have a seismic activity. But uh, by looking at their mass, so I, I, I won't detail the way, but you have different ways of measuring mass. And, and their size, we can derive density and have an idea of how they are how they are composed. So, as I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, the Earth core consists of two parts. There is the molten outer core and the solid inner core, and uh, the Earth is almost entirely rock. So, by extension, we suppose that the other terric planet may have something similar. However, we don't have seismic data, so it's very difficult to do it. And these are uh, a sketch showing the different uh, composition of different planets and uh, moons. So this is our moon, this is here Mars, here Mercury, and here different moons from uh, uh, giant planets. We'll come back on that next week. Uh, we think that Mars have a core as well, a denser core, but it's uh, entirely solid, there's no liquid. One of the reasons we think this is the case, it's because we have no magnetic fields surrounding Mars, while we have some 
surrounding the Earth. Remember, the origin of those magnetic fields is probably due to the liquid phase of the metal within the core of the Earth. So, as there is no uh, evidences of magnetic fields surrounding Mars, we suppose that there is no molten part of the core. And given the difference of density, remember mass is three times the density of water while Earth is five times the density of water, we suspect that the core of Mars is smaller than the core of Earth. However, for Mercury, we suspect that the core is uh, bigger because the density of Mercury is similar to the density of uh, Earth. However, as long as we don't put probes on those different planets to measure seismic wave, we can't tell much more about their internal structure. What we know from uh, Earth is that we have a little sphere, the outer thin layer of rock, or the crust, we call. So Mars, Mercury, and the Moon are thought to have very thick lithosphere that extend almost to their core. Uh, the uh, reason why we think that is because we don't have any uh, evidences of recent seismic activity. So no recent uh, uh, lava flows or, uh, or volcanic activities. Also we have evidences of uh, some in the past but nothing very really recent that make us think that there is no magma. However, Venus is extremely, extremely vol uh, active in terms of uh, uh, volcanoes. There are lots of evidences of volcanoes on, on the surface of Venus. Actually, we know the composition of Venus is highly uh, sulfuric. There's lots of uh, sulfuric acid in the, uh, in the atmosphere of Venus, which are uh, linked to a very, very intensive uh, volcanic activity. So we have lots of evidences that there is large liquid uh, mantle in the core of Venus. So I will go one by one and I mainly focus on Mars and Venus because they are most interesting. So we'll start with Mercury. We'll go very fast on Mercury. There's not much to say about Mercury. It's a pretty boring place. So this is this little guy here. So we have now a very good picture of Mercury. We have sent probes on there. Uh, one of the probes is called Messenger. So this is a close by picture taken by Messenger. And as you can see, straight, Mercury looks pretty much like our moon. It's dead and we have lots of crater impacts and as I mentioned several times if you have lots of crater impacts that means that for a very long time there's no tectonic or volcanic activity because it takes time to have such a cribble of impacts on it. So it's very similar to uh, the moon in several ways. First there is uh, no atmosphere. It's probably due to the small size, smaller size of Mercury, but also the fact that it's very close to the Sun. Uh, we have evidences of lowlands flooded by ancient lava flows, like exactly like on the Moon, that probably come from the early stages of the formation of the planet when it was constantly bombarded by uh, meteorites, and the surface nowadays is heavily cratered. And the main part of our knowledge on um, um, Mercury is coming from one spacecraft called Mariner 10 that probed the planet between uh, 74 and 75. So this is a picture, a composite picture taken by Mariner 10, and this is more or less how you see it view from Earth. So you see, you can see lots of details. And the reason why there has not been much activity on Mercury since is because it's a pretty boring place. One thing that is making it very boring is because it's very close to the sun and has no atmosphere. So during the daylight, when it's facing the sun, the surface temperature is something around 400 Celsius degrees. And during the nights, when it's facing away from the sun, it's probably minus 100, minus 200. So the gradient of, of transition is extremely important. So it's not really a nice place where to be. That's more or less it, what we can say about Mercury. Uh, People are more focused on two other planets, which are Venus and Mars. The last one, you know, because this is potentially a place where we'd like to be. And Venus, this guy here, is definitely the typical place where you don't want to go. So for several reasons. So, Venus. Venus is the second rock from the Sun, rock planet from the Sun. Uh, size and mass are very similar to Earth, so for a very long time we are considering as a twin sister, but actually uh, Venus is extremely hostile environment. It has a very, very thick 
a cloud, uh, a very thick cloud layer on the top of the atmosphere, mainly comp uh, composed by com carbon dioxide. It orbits once every uh, 224 Earth days and rotates on its axis, but in the opposite direction, in 243 Earth days. So the surface, surface atmosphere is hot and dense. Surface temperature is around 250 kel uh, 750 Kelvin. That's something close to uh, 800 Celsius, sorry. And the surface pressure is 90 times the surface pressure on, uh, on Earth. And the reason why it's so style is probably due to a very important greenhouse effect. So we mentioned greenhouse effect last week, and it's exactly, Venus is a good example of when things gone back bad in terms of greenhouse effect. There's a very intense uh, volcanic activity, so lots of CO2 in the atmosphere, so the infrared radiation are totally trapped inside it, and it's just run over. So the temperature is extremely high, and um, it's impossible to uh, almost land over there. And you're probably very familiar with Venus, because Venus is uh, very often confused with a star. It's the brightest star in your sky, more or less. Sometimes it's overtaken by Jupiter, but uh, almost every evening you can see Venus. And it has been for a long time called the uh, Shepherd Star. That means that it was the first one to wake up and the last one to go to bed, like shepherds keeping, keeping chips. So it's very bright, you almost see it every evening, and it's really the first star you see on the sky, usually it's actually Venus. And one, one good way to differentiate a star from a planet in our sky is actually the seeing effect. You mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned the seeing effect. The fact that the atmosphere is distorting the path of light coming from an object. But stars are very far away, so they are almost like point sources. So the seeing effect is very bad for them. You see them blinking a lot, while planets being closer they are more or less extended. So throughout the atmosphere, they're breaking less. So if you see an object that is barely changing with time, it's probably a planet. So the orbit of Venus is peculiar. Almost all the planets, apart from two, Venus and uh, Uranus, are orbiting on uh, the axis the same way they are orbiting around the Sun. So the planet is orbiting that direction, and it's turning in the same direction this way. However, Venus is doing the other way around. Also, it's orbiting that direction. It's turning on retrogradely against its motion. And it's turning very, very slowly. And one uh, explanation for that is more or less the same explanation that we had for the formation of the Moon. It's probably very early on the stages of formation of a planet. There are a massive shock with a big body that went in a shock in the uh, inverse direction of, on its rotation. So Venus initially was turning in this direction, and an object came down and hit the planet and make it turn the other way around. So it probably have been a very important impact. Make it turn very, very uh, slowly as well, because it's very uh, difficult for a planet to go against the motion, its own motion. It's very difficult for the planet to keep rotating against this motion. Uh, and so the... Uh, as a, reason, as a result of this uh, con counterclockwise, its clockwise motion, sorry, as a uh, result of its clockwise motion, it's turning very, very slowly. So the orbital per period is very long. Then, oh yeah, so the, the first, the first uh, explanation for that is the off-center collision with a massive pro protoplanet. Some people also are invoking tidal forces. Mentioned last week, two weeks ago, the effect of tidal forces on the moon. Well, this is the same explanation why the moon is synchronized with its rotation around the sun, you remember, two weeks ago. So this kind of same forces, tidal forces, may have slowed down the rotation of Venus. Okay, so this is a picture taken by a Mariner 10, the same one from uh, Mercury, since we have many of the different probes on Venus. But this is one of the earliest picture we have taken from it. And as you can see, well, you can see only clouds. You don't see much things below the clouds. Actually, you can't see anything below the clouds. And one thing you can mention as well is that there are those stripes or something like look motions 
So if you know, if you look above the Earth from upper, uh, from this uh, international space, uh, <coughs> international uh, space uh, spacecraft, you can see the Earth, and you can see, for instance, the whole motion of clouds on on the on the surface of Earth, formation of typhoons and things like that. So massive amounts of clouds rotating and uh, moving uh, on the surface of Earth. This is something that is probably similar. So you have lots of weathering, important weathering. And actually you can see it even better. This is taken with uh, infrared uh, measurements. So this is the visible picture of it, and this is how it looks in infrared. This is over the south pole of the planet, of Venus, and you see that you have lots of swirling clouds. Actually it's exactly like a massive typhoon or happening almost constantly on the south pole of the planet. So these massive things are creating weather. So there are lots of winds on the surface of Venus. So the atmosphere of Venus is extremely, extremely inhospitable. It's first of all composed of 96% of carbon, carbon dioxide. So once again, this is exactly like the greenhouse effect, effect gone mad. So we are totally dominated by CO2 and as a result of that, there's, it's too hot to have water, so there's no way to absorb the, the CO2 from the atmosphere, like we have on Earth, so it's just keeping very, very hot. There is a tiny fraction of nitrogen, 3.5%. So there are presence of water in the, in the, on the atmosphere of Venus, but it's never under liquid form because it's too hot, and usually it's not pure water. It's usually a mix with uh, uh, chloric acid, so HCl, or hydrofluoric acid, HF. So there are lots of fluor, uh, sulfur, things that smell pretty bad. Uh, if you ever try to smell a rotten egg, this sulfury uh, smell, that's, that's uh, something that you get when you go to volcanoes, for instance. So when, I'm, when you go, if you go to have the chance to go to Hawaii and observe the volcanoes, you will have those sulfur fumes, it smells a lot. It's probably how it smells on the, on the uh, surface of Venus. And it's raining acid, so it's not really nice. So we are complaining about what bad weather here, but don't go on Venus, it's far worse. And the uh, surface temperature is around 745 Kelvin, pretty high. So the surface of Venus is searing hot, and you have very high atmosphere pressure. So there is a lot of wind in the upper uh, atmosphere, lots of weather in the upper atmosphere, but on the surface, because the pressure is so high, it's very difficult to move air, so if you go down to the surface, you barely have any wind. As a result of that, the temperature is very uniform, and uh, you have no seasons. Uh, there is sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, so it's not really good for your skin, and we know that there are very high speed upper winds, and we still have difficulties to explain uh, many part of them. So, as I mentioned, this is a good example of when the greenhouse effect is going bad. Earth is getting rid of its CO2 thanks to the presence of liquid water that is absorbing it. So, where did the water on the surface of Venus go? Well, first of all, the leading theory is that in very early stages, the uh, UV as we know, the UV rays are breaking down the water. So if you don't have any O2 yet present, any ozone, O3, sorry, any ozone, O3 present here, you don't stop UV. So if you have massive uh, uh, UV rays eating the water, it's just destroying the molecules. So this is one way. If you don't form O3 very rapidly, then you get rid of all your water very rapidly. Also, Venus is slightly closer to the sun, so it's slightly hotter. So what water evaporates more, surface temperature is higher. So as a result of those two effects, the fact that the temperature is because of the proximity of Venus to the sun higher, and also the fact that it probably didn't form any ozone uh, layers in the atmosphere early on, then very rapidly the water disappeared on the surface of the planet. And when you don't have water, and lots of uh, seismic activity, like this is the case, then you have a runaway greenhouse effect with lots of CO2 in the atmosphere. But the water be break down into uh, oxygen, right? Yeah. Then why don't they make, uh, make ozone? Okay. 
good, very good question. So uh, the, the, one of the, of the main reason is the temperature. The surface temperature of the, of, the, of the planet may evaporate lots of the water in the atmosphere. And then, uh, of course, like you mentioned, in the case of Earth, the UV at the upper atmosphere are breaking down the uh, molecule of water into uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen is evaporating away because it's very light, and we have this uh, layer of O3, which is protecting the water underneath. But if you have a very high temperature, then the evaporation is going higher. That means that your, your uh, wa vapor of water is going upper in the atmosphere. Okay? So when the breakdown is happening, the gravity is not strong enough to keep the O3, O2, O3 in the atmosphere. So it's evaporating as well. So this is more or less, this is a structure of the atmosphere of Venus. So this is a, a picture I showed you already for the Earth. So this is the temperature on the altitude. And if you remember from Earth, we have several layers due to the composition of uh, the, the atmosphere with a, a slight variation of temperature. So you remember those different layers cor corresponding to the stratosphere, troposphere, etc. But on Venus, as you can see, you, only, uh, you, have, you have less layers happening due to the uh, very, very high temperature of the planet on the surface. And you end up with typically two uh, different uh, layers. One, uh, and mainly uh, this is the layer where you have the, the clouds. So it's composed mainly by uh, sulfuric acids and uh, uh, hydrochlorous in the upper atmosphere. And then the temperature is running very cool, very rapidly as well. So to come back to this greenhouse effect, you have the surface of Venus and then a, a CO2 rich atmosphere. So what's happening is that when the light is coming from the sun here, the sunlight hits the atmosphere and the surface further, but has, and as I mentioned several times, then the surface is re, re emitting the light in form of infrared. So the atmospheric, lower atmosphere and surface is uh, trying to cool by emitting infrared radiation. But as you have lots of CO2 in the atmosphere, it's absorbed it and heats up further the atmosphere. And you have barely any radiation moving away from the atmosphere at all. So it has been, if we had to wait for a very long time to be able to really see the surface of Venus because of uh, the thick layer of atmosphere. It has been uh, possible thanks to the Magellan. So Magellan was equipped with a radar, that means radio observations, and thanks to those long wavelengths uh, light, you can go through the layer of uh, clouds and reveal, actually, the surface of the planet. And what we can see immediately is all those very light structures that are linked with uh, lava flows. There are lots of volcanic activity on the surface of Venus, lots of volcanoes, lots of uh, seas. So you have lots of lava flows, and you barely can see any impact of craters. Those things are actually volcanoes. You barely can see impact of craters, exactly like on the surface of Earth. So it's actually a very intense uh, geologic activity on the surface of Venus. So this is a comparison between uh, images taken in the UV where everything is reflected by the presence of cloud and radio when you go through it. So we can now detail very well the topology of the surface of Venus. So like I mentioned, this is very lightly cratered. The uh, craters look uh, usually young and fresh. That means they don't have multiple craters within one crater. And we have a very extensive surface volcanisms. So the mean surface age is around 300 to 700 million years old. It's pretty recent. So you have, like on, er on Earth, lots of uh, uh, different uh, lands here, creating uh, slightly older parts of, of the crust, and then lots of those flows that are very recent and fresh. And uh, according to a uh, different computation, we can estimate that the surface is entirely remade repainted every half billion years by global volcanisms. So it's refreshing all the time. We actually have been on Venus. We sent 
uh, different uh, spacecraft on the surface of it and different ro of robots. So you have, we have very nice picture. In, so this is uh, coming from the Imagine and uh, spacecraft team. So this one is a, a picture taken through uh, radio. So what's happened is the Imagine and spacecraft was going over the atmosphere of Venus, but quite close of it. And through the radio, it can uh, differentiate the different uh, altitudes of the different months. So you see uh, lots of mountains. And there are very, very massive uh, volcanoes. So this is, uh, once again, from Magellan. This is uh, one of those volcanoes. It's called Mad Mons. It's 8,000 meters of altitude, so probably the same altitude that the Mount Everest. And it's uh, a, a very active. As you can see here, this is where the volcano is. And all those things are uh, evidences of very fresh lava flows. This is what we call volcanic cor uh, coronas. So we have lots of volcano, and you can come back again and again on, on Venus with radio observation, and we'll see the evolution of those flows. So it's actively, currently flowing. Uh, Russians have sent a couple of uh, probes that landed on the surface of uh, Venus. One is Venera 13, that was sent in the early 80s. So this is a robot that landed on the surface of Venus and, and did some uh, study of its uh, composition. That's mainly how we know the density of the planet. We can measure gravity. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, picture taken in real colors. So the colors are yellowish because of the presence of clouds. There are lots of sulfur in the clouds, so it's very yellow. So if you correct from these uh, colors coming from the, surf so the, from the clouds, you see that it's well, greenish. So the composition of the surface of Venus is very similar to the composition of the surface of all the planets and the rocks bodies in the solar system. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so landing on the Venus. Yes. And then how about the lava? Well, the, the, it was a very short mission. I don't know what happened to the, to the probe that is there. It was not even a robot, because I, we'll discuss about Mars. We know that we have sent those rovers that were moving on the surface of Mars. In Venus, it was just a camera, more or less, that landed with an emitter, and it just sent uh, some, uh, some studies. That's it. Just do uh, some uh, spectral, spectral, uh, spectrometry of the, of the surface of the planet and taken some pictures. That's it. It didn't move. And after one or two years, it stopped uh, emitting any uh, signal. So this thing is probably totally destroyed now. So we move to the last planet we discuss about today, which is Mars. And Mars is, uh, has been a, a planet that has been very popular, still very popular. Lots of movies about it. Uh, everybody heard about Martians. Uh, people were thinking that they may have life on Mars. We have some controversy about it. Do we have evidences of life on Mars or not? We have evidences of presence of water on Mars. We have evidences of presence of flows of rivers and actually uh, sea on the surface of water in the uh, su surface of Mars in the past. So it's a very interesting planet because somehow it's a planet that is the most similar to the planet Earth and our solar system. Also, it's slightly smaller, but the fact that it's a bit further from Sun, it uh, definitely is a planet that has been at some point of history habitable and uh, maybe in the future if we go and landscape it. So you know, probably heard about all those uh, ideas of sending people on Mars and growing plants there to create an atmosphere. It's things we call terraforming. There are very, very serious experiments that have been on Earth where they put people into labs for years in the middle of the desert and uh, simulating how it would be to live on Mars, etc., etc. So it's something that we still consider. And there are still people thinking that by 2050 we'll send people over there. And Earth's getting more and more crowded, so maybe one day we'll need to uh, export, colonize the planet. So it's, it's a very, very interesting planet to study. Uh, there are still a lot of uh, experiments going on, on uh, understanding Mars. So, it's the fourth planet from the Sun. It orbits in around 700 Earth days around the Sun, and it rotates almost in 24 Earth uh, uh, hours. So the, the, the cycle of nights and days are very similar to the cycle of nights and days on Earth. Uh, it's half of the size of Earth, 
And uh, there is a thin atmosphere covering the planet. It's mostly carbon dioxide once again. Uh, but because there is a thin atmosphere, then you can keep a little bit of heat. So the colder, colder spot during the nights is going down to minus 140 degrees, and during the day it's not very hot, it's only 21 degrees. The surface pressure also is only 1% of, of the pressure of Earth, because the atmosphere is so thin. And of course, as you have a very thin atmosphere, once again you don't have O3, so you don't have ozone, so you can't really protect yourself from UV radiations. So all the UV radiations are going through the atmosphere, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty much in a, inhabitable as it stays today. And the present day surface of Mars looks more or less like a desert from Earth. So this is a picture of the surface of Mars, and you can see the thin atmosphere, this haze, which is corresponding to atmosphere on Mars. You can also see that there is craters, lots of craters. We come back on that. Lots of craters on the surface of Mars that are telling us that there is no recent geologic activity. So we think, because we think, and we'll show you evidences of that, that there were some water on the surface of Mars, so something happened for Mars to um, lose its atmosphere and lose its water. So this is what we call the runaway refrigerator effect, or the uh, reverse greenhouse effect. So it's exactly the opposite way that what happened on the surface of Venus. What happened is that you start to have CO2 and then lots of water over there. And because the CO2 is mixed with water and the planet can't keep an atmosphere, then the main part of the CO2 is ab absorbed with the water, so you have less and less CO2 in the atmosphere, so the temperature is going down. The CO2 is combined with rocks under the water, but as it's getting cooler and cooler and cooler, you don't have liquid water anymore. So it's getting frozen, ice. And when it's on the form of ice, then it can't keep the CO2 anymore. So it can't re-emit the CO2 anymore. You have no geologic activity to warm up the atmosphere, so the planet is getting totally frozen. And then the, you don't have atmosphere anymore. So this is the opposite uh, way at what happened on the surface of Venus. So there is CO2 in the atmosphere, a little bit, but not enough to keep the atmosphere warm enough to keep water liquid. So it keeps running, so you have less and less atmosphere because it's too cool. So, uh, however, you have a very, very uh, thin atmosphere and you have seasons. So these are a uh, picture of Mars during different seasons. seasons. These are pictures taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So actually, Mars has seasons very similar to those on Earth, and also it's twice as long. Okay, so this is spring, and this is early spring and late spring. So you definitely see that there are differences in the atmosphere. It's more cloudy in early spring, and it's more uh, less cloudy in late spring. And you can see also here, this white spot here, is on the pole you have lots of ice, so there's lots of water on Mars, but it's mainly under, under the form of ice. So you see that there is, it's cooler, so you have lots of ice, a uh, very big ice uh, uh, patch on the northern uh, pole, and when it's getting cooler, it's reduced, so the, the water has evaporated. Uh, it's probably due to the uh, a very important eccentricity of the ob orbit. So we have uh, a shorter and hotter summer in the south and longer and colder winters in the north. Um, Mars is also a subject of lots of uh, winds, so you have lots of activity in, in, in the atmosphere. You can have global dust storms, so lots of wind that is raising the dust from the surface. So this is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope again in 2001. So this is in June and September. While here you can really see, you can see very well the uh, surface of the planet. In September, a storm starts, a global storm. So it's a storm on the, on the scale of the, globe, of the whole planet that's raising all the dust and then you can't see at all uh, the surface of the planet anymore. So because the atmosphere is so thin, because the atmosphere is so thin, you can see very well the surface. So we have a very early uh, picture of the surface of Mars. 
and what we can see is few things. First, you have lots of valleys, but what this one is very famous called the Marineris Valleys. And it's very deep canyon actually. That's one of the one of the proof of presence of liquid water on the surface. You can see that there is lots of impact craters almost everywhere on the surface. And here they are bigger here. That uh, testify that there is no really recent uh, geologic activity, but we still have trace of giant volcanoes in the past, those big months. So once again, we have evidences of uh, past geologic activity on uh, the surface of Mars. You have lots of highlands that are composed by old crust, uh, heavily cratered, and some lowlands, freer craters that are probably resurfaced a few billion uh, years ago. But we don't have any evidences of uh, activity, volcanic activity anymore. And you have a very massive volcano called Mount Olympus, which is the highest mountain in the solar system, something like 15, 20 kilometers high. And, uh, this is a picture of it. So this is Olympus Mount, highest and largest volcano in the solar system. So just to give you an idea, this base is something like it's 200 kilometer and the height is something like 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers. As a comparison, this is the Olympus Venus, or Olympus Mons in, on the surface of Mars, compared to uh, Mauna Loa, which is the highest mountain on Earth, which is the, uh, uh, actually this is the uh, volcano uh, forming the main island of Hawaii. So it's something like uh, 4,000, 4,200 meters above the sea level, but if you count from the base of it, it's something like 14,000. But it's still far smaller compared to Olympus Month. Uh, come back on the volcanic activity of, of Mars. There is no current activity on the surface anymore. So this Mount Olympus, or Olympus Month, is inactive. It's not flowing anymore. The reason why it's very big, it's probably because it erupted for a very long period at a very high rate, while uh, the planet was uh, still uh, geologically active. And if you remember from what we discussed about Earth, you have uh, several ways to keep a planet geologically active. One of the main, uh, one of the first way, the first way is to have uh, intensive bombardment by meteorites, so lots of collisions that keep the interior hot. The other way is differentiation, that uh, big stuff sink while small things raise and the frictions create heat. And the last way is uh, radioactivity in the core. And you, if you remember from Earth, Earth has a big iron core that's extremely radioactive, so it's meeting a lot of heat. So it's heated up the mantle and keep it liquid. But I uh, mentioned at the start of this uh, lecture Mars probably has a very small iron core, so it's less radioactive, so it's not eat, uh, eating enough the interior of the planet to keep it a uh, uh, liquid mantle, hence there's no uh, tectonic activity. Okay, let's go back on the water. So I mentioned that one of the reasons why uh, Mars couldn't really keep up its atmosphere is because the temperature was cooling down and the water was frozen. But we have evidences that there are a lo large amount of water on the surface of, of the planet. And for that, we can see lots of features that haven't disappeared yet. So there is no liquid water on the surface. Uh, we think that its part, main part of it evaporated due to the very low, low pressure. You don't have a very thick layer of atmosphere to keep the, uh, to keep the pressure up, so the water evaporates very quickly. Very low pressure. That means that the temperature at which the uh, uh, water evaporates is very low. But we have lots of evidences of past, uh, uh, past trace of liquid water on the, on, the, on the surface. So we have outflow channels from sudden massive flood. This kind of trace here. So you can see here, if you, if you go on the sea and you look at the tides and the effect on the sands, you will, you will see similar features, like water is flooding. This is a very, very typical from uh, deltas, for instance. If you go to a very, a, a very strong delta, if you observe the, uh, the, the 
bed of a river nearby the, a delta when it's going through the, the, the ocean. If you go to Dan Shui, for instance, and look under the water, you will see these kind of uh, features, those ones, so water was flowing in this direction. Here we have evidences of a of bed of rivers, definitely. We have evidences of splash craters and valleys resembling to river beds. Once again, this is a slope, so you have evidences of, of flows uh, through the slope, gullies. And this is pretty much looks like the bed of a river, even with a turn here. And it's very long, it's several uh, hundred, hundreds of kilometers long. And if you zoom on that part, you see that it's really, really exactly like a river when you remove the water out of it. And furthermore, there are evidences of presence of ice. Because if you go to the poles, I show you, there is a, a very thick layer of ice on the north and southern pole. But even within Martian craters, you have evidences of ice. This is a picture taken by Mars Express, which was one of the probes that landed or been very close to the surface of the planet. And this is a picture taken by the probe. This is ice, water ice. I mentioned that uh, we landed, we, sub we sent several rovers. So this is a picture of one of the, of the, of the rover. And one of the, of the mission was to land within that one of those beds of uh, potential uh, rivers or uh, sea uh, bottoms. So we landed there and we analyzed the composition of the rocks there and we uh, reveal a lot of salt. So there are presence of lots of salt in, uh, in, uh, in the bed of those uh, rivers and uh, sea. And salt is usually also associated to the presence of liquid water that transform uh, the rocks into salts, the calcium into salts. So Mars probably had eventually during its uh, past history looked like something like that with big, a large amount of seas and some uh, rivers. And as I mentioned before the break, more recently, I think it was uh, six months ago, something like that, NASA released some pictures that show evidences. So this is a real call of the pictures from a uh, uh, Mars orbiter. So it's several pictures successively taken. So here you have the, the, the time. So it was taken from uh, spring to summer. And you see the presence of those features that are growing with time. And actually, if you uh, they have pictures for later on, it's recessing. So it's like you have a flow, things moving, going down, and drying up. And those dark features, it's uh, too slow to be really water, cooling water. So what we think it is, it's uh, brines. So brines are a mix of uh, rock, salt, and water. And they are flo floating according to the seasons. When it's getting more hot, water gets a bit more liquid. And this it's like mud, let's say. So this mud is floating through the slopes, getting those uh, features. So still, even of the day of today, there are some evidences of presence of things close to uh, uh, flooding water. So here it's mixed, heavily mixed with salt and, and, and rocks, but still there are evidences of water. So we, we know our evidence is that there are still lots of water on the surface of Mars. Okay. So I mentioned that several times. We've been on Mars at many, many uh, attempts actually. Uh, so several uh, probes have landed on Mars. The last attempt uh, unfortunately failed. But uh, we have sent uh, some rovers, those little robots that are even able to, to move. So here at the head, you have the cameras, that's a sticking picture. Those wings, you have the solar panels, solar, solar panels to, uh, to keep uh, its energy on. And you can, you can also dig a bit and have a, it's equipped with a spectrometer to do some analysis. And it can set via these antennas, and there is a relay orbiting the planet. It can send some results from its analysis to Earth. So this is the Mars Exploration mission with this rover. So as you can see, this is a picture taken by it. It has this little uh, thing that for, for collecting uh, ground and you can analyze it directly. And this is just a solar plan panel. And well, as you can see, it's not, not much on the surface of, uh, of Mars. It's very, very dry. There's no liquid water. 
the ground is composed by a mixture of uh, iron that's giving its reddish color and uh, and uh, lots of different other minerals uh, so we're still exploring uh, people are still uh, debating and one big debate happened a couple of uh, years ago uh, do, do I have a um, you may have heard the story that was 10 years ago 15 years ago some uh, American researcher identify a potential bacteria in the meteorites that was coming from Mars. So, to summarize, the idea was, this is Mars, this is Earth, you have a meteorite, oh, so this is Mars, this is Earth, you had a, a meteorite impacting on the surface of Mars, is ejecting material in the space, and one of the rocks coming from Mars and even on Earth, and was collected by some researchers. So this happened quite often, and actually you can prove, because we know the exact composition of the ground of Mars, you can prove if the rocks is coming from Mars or from somewhere else in the, in, the, in the solar system. So they had to prove that this rock was coming from Mars. And what they identified within that rock is a bacteria, a single bacteria. Actually it was a fossilized bacteria. And they came to the conclusion that then, some, at some point in the evolution of the planet, there were some life form, bacterial, at the bacterial level, but still, it's life. It was the first time that we discovered life outside our Earth. So it, it, it made the front page of the news, and uh, it has been uh, very controversial, lots of debate around that. Uh, the latest results are this bacteria may actually have been a contamination of the sample when the uh, rock ending on Earth. So on the phase when it ended on Earth, it may have been contaminated by bacteria from Earth before collection. And this bacteria may could be Earthian and not Martian. So we still don't have uh, very solid evidences of presence of life in past life on Mars, but all the conditions were there at some point for life to develop. So this is why we are so interested by Mars, because it had liquid water, it had an atmosphere at some point, it was not too cold, not too warm, it had the correct distance from the sun to the developed life. So we think that life may have developed on Mars. And of course, if it happened, that's a big step forward for our understanding of how life is forming on Earth. And uh, it's something we discuss when we talk about exoplanets <coughs> a bit more. But uh, the day of today, we have no real solid evidences of the presence of life on Mars, and we keep looking for it. So that's why we're still sending probes up there, and uh, it's one of the main drivers is to uh, doing uh, biology studies, look, looking for evidences of life in the past. Another story that you may have heard uh, a lot, actually several movies have made out of that, is this uh, famous face on the surface of Mars. So one of the first pictures released by the Viking project in, uh, in the late uh, 90s revealed this feature here. So probably if you browse the internet you have heard about that story. So the first time people saw that, they said, oh, look, this is a face. This is a, a massive statue like we can see on Earth. The Martian in the past, they drove that and they, they just represented their face on a massive scale like we are doing with uh, monuments on Earth. Uh, and of course, uh, that's not true. Actually, this is what happens if you have a higher resolution of the picture. So we have, you, see, you can still see a bit the face, where the, you see the eyes and the nose. When you go a bit more higher resolution, you see that it's actually just a mountain. And the effect was due to the poor resolution. So that was, we're talking about resolution here. This is why we need to have very high resolution instruments to be able to distinguish details in, uh, with high accuracy because otherwise it leads with very, very stupid uh, conclusions. So this is a 3D representation of this mountain on the surface of Mars. It's weird, it's almost square, but uh, this is how it is. And you see it's just a mountain. Right, so no Martians, sorry. Uh, just before uh, ending the uh, discussion on Mars, uh, I have to mention that Mars has two moons that are nothing alike our own moon. Our moon is very big and it's quite uh, far away from Earth. 
Here, there are two moons you can see here on that picture. So it's just an eclipse. You have Phobos and Deimos. Phobos being the closer and Deimos be, being the, the further. This is a close by view of those moons. They are very small. Look, this is five kilometer. So the, this uh, uh, Deimos is something like 20 kilometers diameter. They are not even round. It's like uh, ellipsoid shapes. There are lots of craters, impacts happening even on small scales of those, uh, of those uh, moons, but nothing to say about it. And same thing with Phobos. It's very small, a bit bigger, but still a uh, very small uh, piece of rock. So unlike our moon, which uh, has a very compl uh, complex history, those two things are probably just uh, rocks that were wandering in the solar system and been trapped in the gravity field of Mars and start orbiting Mars. Okay, do you have any questions about Mars before I move to the next topic? So, now, <clears throat> what I would like to discuss for the last half hour of, of this lecture is doing a, a bit more physics, because I'm a physicist, I think physics is very nice, and there is a very, very simple physics that is known very well, which explains the motions of the planets. So, it's something that is uh, actually uh, known and studied since a very, very long time. Uh, around 2,500 years ago, the Greeks get very interested about the planets. So what the Greeks observed is that they have those uh, stars that are more or less fixed, and you have some things that are not blinking, and they are really wandering in the sky with a very weird pattern. So it's called the planetary motions. And this is more or less what happens when you uh, try to follow one of the planets. This is, for instance, the case of Mars. So Mars in the sky is doing, going this way. Oh, it's going back and moving away. And for a very long time, they had a uh, lot of problems to explain what's happening in there. This is a more complex pictures showing uh, different motions of different planets. And you see that planets in the sky are not like doing that, like the sun or like our moon. They're not going in straight line and, and, and orbit on the same path, like the ecliptic. This is where the, the path of the sun on the sky, uh, as seen from Earth, planets usually have very peculiar motions, especially Mars and Jupiter. This is what we call the retrograde motions. So planets is coming actually from the Greeks called wan uh, wanderers. That means things that are not going on straight lines. The planets move with respect to fixed stars. And they don't move like uh, the sun. The planet's movements on Earth orbital motions, this is due to the fact that Earth is turning around the sun as well, explain this apparent very complicated motion. And it took a very, very long time for us to really understand that. The reason why is because as egocentric we are, we are thinking that the Earth was the center of the universe. So if you put the Earth at the center of the universe and try to explain the motion of everything around it, as it's not the case, it's a wrong assumption, we are turning around the Sun, then the motion of Mars and Venus are very complex. I'll come back on that in a minute. What we know of today, the day of today, is that all the planets are orbiting the Sun, and they are not even orbiting in circular motion, they are beating in slightly elongated ellipses. So, what is the cause of these retrograde motions? So this is Mars. So once again, you have Mars coming here. So this is a composite picture with time. Mars is moving here. So it's moving forwards, and suddenly it's moving backward again, and backward, and moving forward again, occurring these loops in the sky. And to explain that, you need all very complicated uh, physics, that's what people were doing in the past, or you go for an heliocentric model. You can't explain that simply if you have a, a, a earth center model. You need an heliocentric model. You, mean, you need to put the sun at the center of the picture. So what happened? Okay, so this is Earth, this is Mars, this is the sun, okay? So this is when we look up to, uh, at Mars, and this is the motion that Mars is doing on our sky. So what happened is first, 
because Mar Earth and Mars are orbiting a uh, different speed around the Sun, so first Earth is ahead of Mars, so Earth is the, ahead of Mars, and then Earth is below Mars. So it's creating this uh, loopy feature on the sky, projecting on the sky. So it's a projection effect due to the different rotation of the two planets around the Sun. So just to explain it a bit more details, this is Earth orbit and this is Mars orbit. So day one, you look at Mars, it's there on the sky. Day two, you look at Mars, it's there on the sky. Day three, you look at Mars, it's there on the sky. So you, you keep going up to day five and then suddenly Earth starts to be ahead of Mars while it was behind Mars initially and Earth starts to be ahead of Mars. So as a result of that, you see a retrograde motion. So at six, so it's going backward, seven, eight, and, and then it keep up. So again, again, Earth is behind Mars and it's going uh, further in the, in the same directions. So this difference, difference orbit of the two planets around the Sun explain why we have those retrograde motions. And believe it or not, it took us almost a thousand years to understand that. I don't go for the full history of it, but there are several figures, several important people that help us to understand the things. One was called Nicolas Copernic, who is uh, Polish, and that really came up with the idea of a heliocentric model, while before that every everyone was still putting the Earth at the center. And another one is called Kepler, Johannes Kepler, he was German. I'm always very bad with European nationalities. Um, so. He was uh, uh, living in the 16th and 17th century and he came up with three very fundamental laws that explain even uh, the day of today the motion of planets around the, uh, around the Sun and planets around other, uh, other suns actually, other stars. So the Kepler laws are still used today for instance when you want to determine the size or the mass of a planet orbiting another star, exoplanets. So he came up with three different laws. The first one is that before everyone were thinking that the orbits were circular, making things very complicated, and came with the idea that actually the orbits of planets are not circular, but they are ellipses. There's no reason why they're exactly, they, could, they have to be exactly circular. They can be ellipses, with the sun as one of the focus. And then the second law is uh, saying that a line from a planet to the sun sweeps over equal areas in equal interval of time. I'll explain to you in a minute. And the last law, which is probably the most important one, or the most famous one, is the fact that there is a direct relationship between the uh, planet's orbital period and the, the, the dis average distance to the Sun. So if you take the orbit period of the planet, the time it takes to uh, do a full circus around the, around the Sun, and its distances, you have a relationship P square equals A cubed in years on astronomical unit. So, the first law. Well, first of all, the first law is planets orbit the Sun in an ellipse, with the Sun is one of the focus. So it was uh, published in uh, 1609. So, the planet is not orbiting the Sun in circular motion, it's actually slightly elongated, and one of the focus is the Sun. So what is the focus of an ellipse? Just remind you quickly, how to, you can draw easily an, an ellipse, you take a string, you put two uh, uh, pins down and you do a triangle like that. These are the two focus and with your pen you draw, try to draw a circle, you will draw an ellipse and those two things are focuses. That's what we call focus and ellipse. And I mentioned several times eccentricity. Eccentricity defines how elongated the ellipse is. So it's the ratio between C, that means the distance between the focus and the uh, semi-axis uh, major, A. So here this is the center of the ellipse, this is one focus, C is the distance between the center of the focus, and A is the uh, semi-axis, major axis of the ellipse. And if you do the ratio, it gives you the electricity. So if you see that if, if the eccentricity is, uh, uh, if C equals A, the eccentricity is uh, one, that means that you have a circle. And the uh, smaller the C is, the closer C is to zero, so the closer the eccentricity is to zero, the more elongated your ellipse is. So you have 
different mathematical definition. This is the true de mathematical definition of an ellipse with x squared plus y squared, a being the semi-axis major and b the semi-minor um, semi axis, minor axis. Okay, well, these are uh, different uh, formulae. You don't have to remember that. I have to remember is that if the eccentricity is very close to zero, it's a circle, and if it goes to one, it's more and more elongated. So there are different examples of different eccentricities. So, we mentioned that already. Uh, actually, the uh, moon Earth motion is not circular. It's an ellipse, very uh, low electricity uh, ellipse. It's almost circular, but not uh, completely. So the distance between Earth and the Moon is changing with time. Sometimes it's closer, that's what we call the perigee, 356,000 kilometers, and sometimes it's further. It's because the uh, Moon is orbiting around the Earth uh, following an ellipse with uh, the uh, Earth one of the focus. So this was the first Kepler law. The second law is a bit complicated to, uh, uh, to say, but it's actually very simple to understand. It's a line from the sun to the planet sweeps out an equal area in an equal time. So the planets move faster if they are near the sun. So what happens is that if you trace a line between the presence of the planet and the sun, okay, the planet, the time for the planet to go from this point to that point will be exactly the same time that the planet to go from this point to that point. Means that the two blue areas are the same. So what's happening, in, in, a, in, a few, in few words, is that when the, the planet is going closer to the sun, it's go faster. And it's then slowing down. Slowing down, and then it's going closer, closer to the sun, it's going faster, and it's going down, etc. We have this kick effect when it's coming closer to the, to the sun. And it's something that we know very well with comets, for instance. We'll talk about comets in a couple of weeks. Uh, we know that comets are li uh, lighting up when they are closer to the sun, so they're visible, but for a very short period of time, and then they are taking ages to come back. Okay? So this second law is just telling you that when an object is uh, orbiting around an ellipse and is getting closer to the sun, it's, it's going faster when it's closer. And the last law, which is probably the most important one, the third law, is that the ratio between the square of the period of two planets is equal to the ratio to the cube of the distances. So, if you suppose that uh, for Earth the uh, period is one year and the distance is one AU, you came up to this very, very easy to understand formula where for any planets around the Sun, you take the period to the square and then you, you got the distances to the cube. And it works very well. And that's part of the homework I'll give you in two weeks. We have an exercise about that showing that this law is working very well. Okay, so these are three Kepler's law. It's getting very famous because this formula is actually still used and valid and used for a lot of things, including when you have uh, discovered an exoplanet, that means a planet that is orbiting another uh, star, you can get easily the period, it's easy to measure, and, or easily the distance, and then you can uh, go, uh, get the other, uh, uh, the other uh, characteristic just using the Kepler formula. This is very basic. So let's go a bit more complex. This was easy, and things get even more clear and more interesting thanks to that guy. So you probably all heard about Einstein. He's probably one of the biggest genius of the uh, 20th century. Well, this is, according to many people, including me, the biggest genius ever. He's called Isaac, Einstein, uh, Isaac Newton. Sorry, he was born in the 17th century and lived through up to 18th century. He was uh, British, and that guy uh, created physics. So if there are some physicists in the, in the, uh, in the audience, you all heard about Newton. He did optics, he did thermo thermodynamics, he did uh, uh, pff, many, many things. He, he created one telescope, I mentioned that already. That's the re or origin of the uh, reflecting telescopes. And one of mainly his biggest achievements is, is gravitational law. So he came to the idea that actually there is a uniform 
universal uh, law called gravity that is acting between two bodies of the same weight and of different weight. And uh, this uh, gravity force is explaining why we're standing on Earth, why the moon fall from the tree, but does also explain why the moon is orbiting the Earth or why the Kepler law are such as they are. So it's very, very important. So gravity. Gravity is uh, the law of universal gravity as stated by uh, Newton, is that every object in the universe attracts every other object with a force uh, directed along the line of center of the two objects. And you have an object here and another one, and they attract each other. We are attracted by Earth, we all know that. That's why we stick on the ground. That's why if I drop something that I don't care about, because otherwise it will break. If I drop that piece of plastic, it will fall down. And you can do for everything, it will always fall down. This is gravity. What happens is that we are attracted through gravity by the Earth. The Earth is more massive than us, more massive than me. Even if I'm quite massive, Earth is even more massive than me. So I'm attracted by it. What you may not know is that you also attract Earth. There is an opposite effect. Earth is attracted by us. But we are so tiny compared to its mass that it doesn't feel the effect. It's a tiny, 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 tiny effect. But we are attracting, we are changing the gravity of the Earth. So this is uh, how you state the law in uh, using mathematic formulae. So these two forces are going in the opposite direction. And actually, uh, the force is the product of the mass of the two bodies. So, and uh, it's uh, related to the distance of it. So if you take the force by uh, exerts by the uh, body two here of the mass M2 on the body ma uh, one of mass M1, so this force F1 is equal to G, which is what we call the gravitation law. It's a universal gravi gravitation constant times the uh, produce of the mass of the two objects divided by the distance of the two objects to the square. And G has this value, and it's universal. I mean, it's true everywhere in the universe. So you probably have heard the, the, the story of the apple. Uh, so Newton had the idea of this by uh, when, well, this is the, the story. I'm not sure it's true. But um, he had the story, the idea of this when observing an apple from, from a tree. So he observed the apple falling from the tree, and he thought, hmm, it would be very nice if the fact that the apple is falling from the tree is exactly the same, uh, can come up with this, exactly the same law that is explaining why the moon is orbiting around the Earth. And actually, he, came, he cooked up uh, an idea, and he came up with this universal gravitation law. And what is the idea? Is that, imagine that you are very high on a mountain, a very high mountain, and you have a cannon, and you just send uh, uh, an object, uh, let's say a bullet, okay? So you, your cannon is powerful, so at first, because of the gravity, what happens is if that thing is going to throw a ball, the, cannon will, uh, the, the bullet will go up and then go down because the gravity is attracting it. But imagine that's, that's throw it even stronger, so it's going further and go down again. And imagine, once again, I'm, I'm, going, I'm sending it that strong but actually, it never managed to fall up on the, on the floor and come back where we are. So that was the idea behind uh, Newton's, is that for the moon, it's what happens. If the moon is, is traveling at a speed so fast that it's actually falling, keep falling, and never reach the floor. Do you know the Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy? Have you ever read that book? It's Douglas Adams, well, probably not geeky enough. But uh, it's a very famous book from a British author. And uh, he has in this book a recipe to fly. So the best idea to fly is to fall down. You jump and fall down, but you always miss the floor. So if you always miss the floor, you will fly. So that's exactly what happened here is that the, the bullet is falling, but he always miss the floor. So it keeps rotating around the Earth. So if it's too slow, it fall, it fall back. And if it's too fast, of course, you expect you uh, escape the gravity. So you send it too fast, then it's going in the space. Right? So this is just a very uh, easy way to explain 
the rotation of the planets around the Sun or the Moon around the Earth. So this comes with the orbital motion law. When you have the Earth and the Moon, the Moon has a given a velocity and due to the uh, gravity attraction, the Moon is traveling fast enough to keep on orbit around the Earth. So the Moon and the Earth attract each other due to the gravity, through gravitation. Uh, Earth is actually more massive than the, uh, than the Moon, so the Moon's uh, effect on Earth is very small. Actually, you know that it exists, it's called tides. We mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. But it's still smaller than the uh, effect of Earth on the Moon. So what happens is the Earth's gravitational force constantly accelerates the Moon towards Earth. And this acceleration is changing the Moon's direction constantly, making orbiting uh, in an ellipse around the Earth. So if you are a bit more versatile with uh, mathematics and uh, are interested in that, we can actually easily redemonstrate the laws of Kepler using just Newton. It's an exercise usually asked to my uh, undergrad, uh, undergrad students when they are taking my cosmology class. The first exercise is to redemonstrate Kepler's law using a uh, gravitational law of, a new, of a Newton. So what happened? is uh, this is all a problem of ratio of mass. The center of Mars is actually the distance between, uh, the average distance between two objects weighed by the mass. That means that an object which is more massive than the other, the center of mass will be closer to it. Okay, so actually, if you take the Sun, the system the Sun and Jupiter for instance, the gravity is acting on the two bodies so actually, the center of mass of the system is not exactly on the center of the Sun. It's slightly shifted. Of course, the difference of masses is 99.9%, .9%, so it doesn't affect it. But if you take two things that are a bit less different, for instance, the Earth and the Moon, the Earth and the Moon, the, moon, the Earth is far more massive than the, uh, than the Moon. However, there is a slight shift in the center of, ma of mass compared to the center of the, the planet, the, the center of Earth, which is creating this tides effect that we mentioned uh, la, uh, two weeks ago when we were talking about the moon. Okay? So actually the shift, slight shift of center of mass that is creating the tides effect. So by playing with that, you can redemonstrate easily the Kepler's law. Uh, so if you're interested, we can, I can, I can, I can show, show you that later or, or give you a, a piece of paper, a sheet of paper explaining how it works. Okay, do you have any questions about Kepler's and Newton? Some, one thing that I, I have to mention is that you don't need anything more complicated than that to send rockets in the solar system. We do slight corrections to, uh, to the general relativity, but however, this is this very simple physics that is known since almost 600 years that entitle us to send people on, on, on the moon. Okay, the calculation we are made only using uh, Newton to send, uh, to send people on the moon. We didn't need something very complicated. So it's very, very robust physics. And it's working very well. That's why physics is interesting. The, just using this very simple gravity law, you just use the, 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 the law of gravity from Newton. The, comp uh, the calculation to send people on the moon, we are just using this theory. There is a far more complex theory invited by Einstein at the uh, start of the 20th century, which is called general relativity, which explains a lot of things at the cosmological scale. So for people like me that are interested in the universe, we mention that when we start talking about uh, the universe evolution. Then you need to go for more complex physics. But this very simple Newton and physics explain a lot of things at the scale of the solar system. Almost everything. Okay? All right, well, so this is done for today.